And this stuff works fantastically on wood structures just as well it works on an armor on a tank. And I've shot up everything and done all the testing for it. And it's awesome in combat. I mean, it kills everything. So this round is flying through the air. It's a giant dart of uranium that weighs 10 pounds for the Abrams tank. It weighs three quarters of a pound for the one that comes out of the A-10. And it weighs a half a pound for each individual round that comes out of the chain gun on the Bradley fighting vehicle. A half a pound. Now, the guys in the Bradley fighting vehicle, and I'm sorry, sir, I'm going to give you some information. You're sitting on those hot rounds, and they're basically just sitting on the floor of your thing, and your gonads are sitting right next to them. It ain't a good day in River City. And I did the research for the Army on it at Fort Benning in Georgia at the 29th. He doesn't like this because he's from the 29th of Fort Benning, Georgia. Now, when this round impacts, 40% to 50% of this round shatters in what we call spalling. So you have oxide and dust and all of these uranium particles. Now, they're all on fire. They're moving at 3,000 feet per minute. Unbelievable velocity. Okay? Right, no, 3,000 feet per second, not minute. 3,000 feet per second. Okay? Close to a mile a second. And these suckers are going across there, and anything that's inside there is going to blow up and it's going to burn. The uranium round doesn't blow up. The uranium round, what it does is it causes secondary detonations from impact and fire. And you'll see the vehicle's catastrophic explosion. And everybody dies. Now, if you're inside and it doesn't blow up, you've got the shrapnel and you've got terrible wounds. Now, the standard medics and doctors, they ain't going to touch them. We had the 2nd Brigade Commander, 2nd Armored Division, Brigade Commander, a colonel, had a real bad day with the DU munitions up in Iraq. The doctors weren't going to touch him. So General Franks, a three-star general, called our team in, put me on a helicopter with my medical bag, and said, hey, Doug, go take care of my Brigade Commander. And we flew up to Iraq. And we had to decontaminate and do surgery. I'm a combat medic. I'm an old 91B. I've been through a whole lot of things in my military career of 35 years, since 30, over 35 years since I first went in. I'm an old combat medic. I had three years front line in the infantry as a combat medic, medical team leader. So I'm out there in the back of a tank doing surgery in Iraq on a brigade commander that shot up with DU munitions. Hmm, not a good day. Now, you've got to understand, Iraq didn't have DU munitions. You like to do surgery on one of your own troops because your own troops shot them up? So we got up there and we're cleaning this up. I can't get medical care for the casualties. I can't get medical care for the casualties to this day. They don't give it to them. I had 123 friendly fire casualties that survived DU impacts by my count as the investigating officer. And you can go to the Department of Veteran Affairs and they claim about 33, maybe 50 people are providing medical care for. Well, I'm supposed to be in that program, but they haven't, I haven't been up there since 99. DU munitions, which we can verify going back all the way back to 1943. I got a memorandum up here to General Leslie Groves, who was the commander of the Manhattan Project, where they told General Groves to develop uranium munitions and radioactive munitions, the dirty bomb, to contaminate air, water, and soil and cause all the health effects. Now, going back as far as 1943, they knew that there were no medical care and treatment for exposure to radioactive materials. There isn't to this day. There is none. There ain't none. And they knew that the gas masks and the mop suits couldn't stop the stuff out. Because the gas mask that's issued to the troops, not only has got holes and tears in it, but the filters that they put in these things, it's a canister filter now, only takes stuff out maybe 0.3 or 0.5 micron. Now, most of this stuff is down at the range of 0.1 micron when it's developed. So it's like a particle going down through the middle of this church. The filter doesn't stop anything. You want to stop a war, ladies and gentlemen? You want to make the troops not go, and you make sure the commanders comply with what their unit status report is and report that their equipment is defective and their troops don't have combat training and they don't have the medical care. The commander cannot deploy a unit to warfare. He cannot go into combat if he's a unit status report is at USR 3 or 4 level. They can't do it. They have to be a 1 or a 2. 
I got a soldier shaking his head. He understands this totally. You want to stop a war? That's how you stop a war. Because, ladies and gentlemen, when you look at the effects of uranium munitions, and myself and my team were sick within 72 hours, the first cancer started within eight months, and the first death within two years, and they're continuing to this day. And we can't get medical care yet. And the reason you're not going to get medical care is real simple. If they acknowledge the health and environmental effects of uranium munitions and all the other technology that we use in warfare, the soldier ain't going to go to war. Your job is to kill, but you don't want to die. And you don't want to come back maimed for life. When you go to war, that's what happens. Now they get this crazy mentality that they got all over the place right now. They're telling these kids, you can kill, you can do this, and you come back and you're a hero. They don't tell the kids of what the reality of war 